right. Welcome. So we still have a few people coming in and out, but we might as well fire up at this point. So I'll be talking about diamond mechanosynthesis. This is work that Rob and I have been working on for a while now, a couple of years. And before I do, I would like to wave around a document that says Standard Registry of Diamondoid Nanomechanical Parts and Processes, a proposed project of the Nanofactory Collaboration. The idea is simple. We're looking for a volunteer. This volunteer will actually do work. They'll set up a wiki. They'll put in uh, descriptions of molecular parts. They'll put in descriptions of molecular tools. They'll put in descriptions of uh, various uh, chemical reactions. This is going to be a place where you can put a lot of useful descriptions of what's going to be needed as we are working towards building a nanofactory, actually building a nanofactory. And it's a, a set of tools and ideas that's fairly focused. So what I've done is I've arranged these slides in two parts. First is a brief introduction to make sure we're all on the same page. And you've probably seen this brief introduction. So I will, I will be going through it fairly rapidly. The first thing I'd like to do is simply say, well, there are some web pages that you could look at. So here's a web page, molecularassembler.com. It's got a bunch of information on it describing what's involved in sort of how it is we move forward to make nanofactories and so forth and so on. And it discusses this long-term uh, goal of designing and ultimately building a diamondoid factor. So that's one thing. So molecularassembler.com, and then once you go to that, that domain name, then you can follow links around. One of them is on the nanofactory which discusses various aspects of that, and there are other links that are, are there, and links to other things that are of interest. So that, that is useful, and people have finished writing it down who want to write it down. Okay, good. All right, how many people have seen this slide? You're joking. <laughs> I am, uh, I've been using this slide for a decade now. Oh, that's great, man. This is, this is wonderful. All right, we have a, a new, fresh slide, which is never before been seen. Yes, yes indeed. Let's go for it. Uh, so, so, so the basic idea is we're talking about health, you know, to, to give the framing of all of this, we're talking about health, wealth, and atoms. And if you rearrange the atoms in coal, you get diamond. Those are the upper two pictures in the left. If you rearrange the atoms in sand and add a pinch of impurities, then you get computer chips. So computer chips are valuable, and rearranging the atoms in that way is valuable. And finally, if, if I think I softened that picture, actually, to, to show someone in a hospital as opposed to someone dead. <laughs> but, but, but as you can see, the, the, the atoms involved in someone who's dead and someone who's alive and healthy are in fact the same atoms, and it's how they're arranged that makes a big difference. <laughs> so, as you can see, it's very important how atoms are arranged. So that's, that's sort of the high-level discussion. And we've been seeing three major trends in manufacturing, which are towards flexibility, uh, greater flexibility in the manufacturing process, greater precision in the manufacturing process, and lower cost. So we've been seeing these trends over time, and as we look into the future, we're going to reach a point where the limits of those trends are limits that we are actually approaching very closely, where we are actually able to arrange atoms pretty much uh, in most of the ways permitted by physical law, which is what Feynman was talking about in 1959. So uh, how many of you have, have read Feynman's There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom? Ah, yes. Okay. Good, good, good. So, anyone who hasn't, it's up on the web. It's an excellent read. It's vintage Feynman. It's great fun. So, Feynman is talking about that. Now we get a quick shift. Uh, when you are talking about arranging the atoms the way you want, the first thing you say is, well, there are 100 elements in the periodic table. Well, okay, let's throw out most of those and focus in on diamond, because diamond is really good stuff. Diamond has better materials properties than almost anything else. So diamond is hydrogen and carbon. And the carbon is mostly used to build a body, and the hydrogen is used to terminate the surface. So if you look at diamond, diamond has, well, you don't have to read all those things. It's, it's wonderful. It's stronger. It's lighter. It has a bigger band gap. 
it's more transparent. It has higher electron mobility. You name it, it's got it. It's usually either the best or close to the best in all the materials categories, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions. Yes? Why is the bigger band gap good? Uh, bigger band gap is good because it lets you have a higher operating temperature, so you can run this thing scalding hot. So that's a, that's a wonderful property. And scalding hot means, A, it will tolerate a hotter environment, and also, B, you can just run more power through it and run it real hot, and it still works. So that's, that's a useful property to have. The other reason it's a useful property is the smaller the band gap, the more you have to worry about thermal noise. So in other words, things bounce back and forth from one to the other, so you have risk. This gets to be, you know, if you're talking about a one electron system, so, you know, future electronics, you have one electron moving around, then it's very nice if the one electron moves around and you don't have thermal noise creating another electron or making an electron go away, so it becomes an issue there. So good wide band gaps are nice things to have. Uh, and then, you know, you also get a lot of other properties as well in terms of diamond. Yes? What about the fire hazard? Fire hazard? Oh, yeah, it burns. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> diamond is not perfect. You take it, you burn it, you know, these oxides are, are better for, for some things. Uh, so if you have very, you know, various, various things are more fire resistant. So yes, it is the case that it is not, you don't want to use diamond for everything. For example, in the lining of a throat of a rocket. That's why we say diamondoid instead of diamond. Diamondoid includes sapphire. Yeah, diamondoid includes sapphire. Yeah. Of course, we'll be focusing mostly on the hydrocarbons, but for, at but first, yeah. but at first, but but the broader picture is yeah, you can you can include other stuff. How hot do you have to heat it? Diamond? Yes. Yeah. Before it fries? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, thousand What's degrees, seven thousand degrees. <coughs> degrees. Yeah. If you hit two thousand, it's pretty much gone. Yeah, that's what I'm Melted. Yeah, that 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 order of magnitude. I mean, mostly I just think about operating at very low temperatures. You know, boiling water is fine. <laughs> Not a big deal. Okay, so what kind of things might you build if you had hydrogen and carbon? Well, here's a hydrocarbon bearing. Okay, it's it, it basically two pieces of diamond that are bent. You take a piece of diamond, bend it into a collar. You take another piece of diamond, bend it into a bigger collar, stick the smaller one into the bigger one, and voila, you have a bearing. Uh, you can also have a universal joint. This is, a again, hydrogen and carbon, purely hydrocarbon. Nice structure, interesting molecular structure. So here's another example of something you could have. Here's something that was done at NASA Ames a few years ago using bucky tubes and modifying bucky tubes so you can have gears and things like that. So some basic mechanical structures. If you go beyond hydrogen and carbon, you can start to talk about more complex structures. These are, how do I put it? If you go beyond hydrogen and carbon, then from a mechanical perspective, you get a little, you know, you get, you get, you get an increase in your, your set of capabilities, but it's not a vast increase. Here, for example, we have a bearing. We could make a bearing of similar size, maybe not quite as small, or maybe not quite as good, but similar size out of hydrocarbon, and it would be fine. But you can also, and if you have the additional elements available, you can go and do something a bit more flexible. Here's something where it's a planetary gear. This is a, a something that's would be familiar, for example, in a modern hybrid automobile. They have planetary gears inside them to, to play games with how they manipulate power and reassign it from the drive wheels to the batteries to the, to the engine and stuff like that. Uh, planetary gears can be made very small. This, again, this is a planetary gear. It happens to involve more elements than hydrogen and carbon. But you could make a hydrocarbon planetary gear if you wanted to. It'd probably be a little bit larger. This particular planetary gear, uh, yeah, like I say, it's, it, it's something that uh, people would be familiar with, except for the very small size. And also, the other thing about this, about using multiple elements, is you make them colorful. So one of the one of the critical <laughs> issues. Now, look, this is very important when you're talking with the press. The reason that you see this thing in the press coverage and not one of the black and white images, not one of the hydrocarbon structures, is the hydrocarbon structures are black and white and they're less interesting. So the press likes color, uh, unless, of course, they're doing a black and white press run for a, for a newspaper or something, in which case they'll go for the hydrocarbon bearing. Yes? Yeah, this uh, 
there's a possibility of using functional color coding rather than elemental color coding. Yes. With hydrocarbons, you could indeed, you could show stress or something like that. You or, could use or which part of the machine it is. Yes, sort of like the, yes. Like yes. in your 3D model. As opposed to the, 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 the color coding here, which is used right. to show which elements are involved. Yeah. Is this the one that Bill Roberts was actually yes. simulated? This was yeah. simulated. So this was one that, this, uh, this planetary gear was simulated by Caltech, uh, by some guys down at Caltech, Bill Gard and people in his group, and it looks like it actually works. I mean, if you drive it hard, now we had some interesting uh, discussions, there was an earlier version that was driven very hard up into the terahertz frequency and managed to skitter and skip and other problems. If you slow it down and are a little bit more, and it was also redesigned to be a, a little bit tougher, if you slow it down, it actually works seems to work reasonably well. But the, the overall lesson behind this is this planet, you know, I wouldn't stake my life that that exact design is going to work because of various issues about, you know, you might have to tweak it a bit. But something very close to that design pretty obviously works. And it's very clear that you can make small planetary gears on the order of this size. So the conclusions you draw from this kind of design effort are conclusions of the form, yeah, that, that kind of structure looks like it's feasible. Yes. So how does that compare to the uh, you know, bacterial flagellar motor? motor which oh yeah, the bacteria, uh, the biological systems have, how do I put it? Their performance is much worse in terms of rotational speed, in terms of power, in terms of efficiency. You know, you go down the line, the biological systems, you know, it, what's remarkable about the biological systems is not that they work well, but that they work at all. Right. I mean, my gosh, that you built you did what out of what <laughs> in water, and, and it works. Wow, that's that's great. I mean, that's really phenomenal. Are so, these like especially more the more like multi-element uh, designs? Are they more? Do they vibrate more? Like so, uh, like in a mechanical? Like, oh yeah, if you design? look at this thing, it can vibrate. Certainly, if you look at multi-part designs, and one of the things you have to be concerned about is, are they going to wiggle and vibrate? Uh, one of the things you do is make it so that the barriers to rotation or the barriers for proper motion are very low so that it doesn't have much opportunity to get into sympathetic vibrations at different frequencies. But if you run them fast enough, I mean there have been simulations of various molecular bearings. If you run them fast enough, they start doing all kinds of weird things and breaking up. So the slower you run them, of course, then the more stable they are against sort of undesired vibrational problems. The same thing as happens in a motor. Can it be too slow? Um, Depending on the design, I and mean, most of the designs we use, the answer is no. So if you've got a design where you've made your barriers very low and it, it rotates very smoothly and easily, then you can just slow it down and slow it down and slow it down. You don't have to worry about the speed. Uh, you could, th I mean, there are sort of certainly designs in electronics where you have to operate at a certain speed. If you go too slow, you know, the charge dissipates before you get around to moving it. And in mechanical designs, there, I think there are things that would create similar problems, but you know, we just don't go in for complicated designs. Simple designs that, that se work semi-statically are the rule at this point in time because they're easier to analyze. Other questions? Uh, yeah, the gear can go up to gigahertz. Yeah, this, this gear could operate at a gigahertz. Uh, the planetary gear could operate at gigahertz quite comfortably. Yeah? Um, what kind of simulation do you perform on this? Is it a dynamic simulation? Or? Uh, the Caltech people did a molecular dynamic simulation. So they rev they started at, at uh, zero speed and ramped it up with force and then began watching it do something useful and interesting. Uh, I think the first time they did it, they took, they took an earlier design and just twisted it with some incredibly large force and ran it at, at a terahertz, and it, it didn't work very well. <laughs> so I, it's, it's an interesting problem because obviously if you're doing computational modeling, you have a limit in the number of computer cycles you have, and one of the things you do is you say, well, I want something interesting to happen. So you take your computer power, you figure out how fast you have to run the thing for something interesting to happen. I, I want it to turn three revolutions or something. And then you run it at a speed which will give you that something interesting. Now, if it happens you have a small amount of computer power, then the speed is going to be very, very high. Then you might well break the thing by operating it a lot faster than anyone was anticipating. Yes? So in our simulation, did it uh, simulate friction? And is, if so, is Everything. How much heat? Okay, so yeah. what sort of heat's generated? I forget the numbers, but okay. if, you crank it, if you crank it around, I mean, you're going to be pumping energy into the system, so, so you are generating heat. At, at the terahertz rate, 
It, was it starting to fail because of, of the heat or because of the non-thermal vibration? Yes. Non -thermal non -thermal vibration. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> At that speed, it was failing for all kinds of reasons. Okay. Right. Uh, Ralph? Yeah. You, you said uh, everything. Uh, seems to me a year or two ago, I heard uh, some uh, things coming in from uh, England, uh, <coughs> Phil Moriarty and uh, others uh, over there saying that you really can't simulate some of these strange forces when you get down at the quantum level. Uh, what's, what's missing in terms of the ultimate accuracy that you'd like in uh, kind of computer modeling or something like this? Well, these things actually, yeah, now? okay. So, so the answer is, if you're looking at a structure like this, these are structures where you're saying, here is a specified set of bonds, you have a stable structure, it looks perfectly reasonable, and you can model it using molecular mechanics. Molecular mechanics models the forces between the atoms, and it models the atoms themselves as point masses, Newtonian point masses. And it turns out there's something called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which is a fancy way of saying atoms are heavy, electrons are light. If I want to model the behavior of a system involving atoms, I can basically treat the electrons as a cloud that just settles into the ground state given a fixed location of the, of the nuclei. And therefore, I can model the whole system quite accurately by saying the nuclei are point masses and the electrons provide the electronic structure which describes the forces between those point masses. So that's a 30-second description of something that normally okay, would take an hour or so. Is this the same computer modeling uh, software that uh, you folks uh, used in uh, trying to model uh, tool tips? And no, tool tips around? involve making and breaking <coughs> bonds. Okay. You, should, you should point out that what you were just describing, <coughs> the Born-Oppenheimer thing, that's, mm -hmm. that's the quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry simulation, not a yes. molecular mechanics simulation, yeah. and that's what's missing. Yeah. They're arguing yeah. that you can't simulate these things with complete certainty just using molecular mechanics because possibly some of those uh, the gears that are hitting each other, they might form a chemical reaction between some of the yeah. gear teeth because of the forces being applied, something like that. So to, to check that out, you have to use uh, a simulation package that can model that sort of thing, which would be uh, density functional theory or ab initio or something like that. And right but now the limit is... simulation uh, models exist now? Uh, uh, right now you can do uh, density functional theory up to maybe a few hundred atoms conveniently. This would be, uh, well, the one that was up before is several thousand. So we're just about, we're, we're almost, in fact, we think there might be some packages where we could actually do DFT on several thousand atoms, and that would be the first thing we'll put on them, is to simulate one, because that's never been done before. But we have no reason to believe that it would fail, based on what we know. Okay. Okay. So this is a neon pump. The idea, again, this is a mechanical device. The core on the right rotates. The core is actually inserted into the main, main part of the pump, and the idea is neon atoms migrate along. You'll notice that in the core, there is sort of a helical structure in the middle, and as you rotate, it's been designed so that the neon atoms sort of slide along and will come out the, out the, out the other end when you rotate it. Again, this has been simulated by the folks down at Caltech, so Bill Goddard's group has taken a look at it. And they looked at it and said, gee, it looks like it actually pumps neon. It probably is not as selective as we might have liked, so it probably will pump a few other small uh, small atoms in that size range, but it looks like it's a pretty good neon pump. So and essentially it's an Archimedes. Yeah. I want to add one more thing. That's also a, a rotary motor driven by gas pressure if you operate mm -hmm. it in the opposite direction. If you just push gas through it, you'll get a you'll get rotary motion. It's a real, real nice motor. Yes? Do you know what force field they use on this? Um, what was that? What force field do they use? Well, Bill Goddard is fond of driving, which is a terrible force field. Uh, but I think they also... Yeah, it was, it was done a long time ago. Yeah, it was done a while ago. I think they probably... They, ha they have a tendency driving, to tune yeah. up their own force fields, I think it was though. driving. Yeah. It was driving? Because yeah. they also have a tendency to tune up their own force fields. I mean, yeah. Bill's approach is driving as a general force field, but, you know, you just use that for your first approximation. Then you tune up a force field yeah. based on some quantum mechanical calculations for the particular structure. The Nanorex is using their own custom yeah, force field. Yeah, they've got their own custom so. force field. The answer is I'm not sure. Uh, quite possibly it was driving. I don't think the particular force field is critical, except to the extent that if you want to drive it to the point where it breaks up, it's important to have a force field where the atoms can fall apart. So in other words, some force fields have a harmonic potential, and the bonds just can't break. Uh, and if you put in something which allows the bonds to break, like a Morse potential, then if you drive it hard enough and hot enough and fast enough, 
you'll be able to break it, and you'll be able to get some idea of how fast you can drive it uh, in order to, to make it fail. So that would be the, the, the only interesting thing, I think, about picking a, a different force field. Most of these structures are fairly stable. In other words, if you look at them, people will say, oh yeah, that's a fairly boring structure. In fact, one of the problems we have is chemists look at some of the structures we're talking, particularly when you go to hydrocarbon structures. Chemists look at it and say, that's really boring. <laughs> and you don't want me to publish something about a boring structure, do you? I want an interesting structure where interesting means that we, didn't, we wouldn't want to touch it because, it, you know, it's on the verge of falling apart. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. Okay, a uh, quick overview of making diamond. If you want to make diamond today, one of the ways of doing it is with chemical vapor deposition. Chemical vapor deposition involves making a highly reactive gas, and that gas involves things like uh, hydrogen, and some form of carbon, so you have reactive species of carbon. You add energy in some form. So you wind up with very reactive species of carbon, CH3, for example. That's a reactive species of carbon. It's got a dangling bond. It wants to react. Or you have, um, you need atomic hydrogen. And I won't go into the reason you need atomic hydrogen, but typically in these plasmas you have a lot of atomic hydrogen. And the result is that you react with the surface. So you abstract atoms from the surface, in particular if you have a hydrogenated diamond surface, then an atomic hydrogen will react with the surface, pluck off a hydrogen, leaving a dangling bond on the surface, a reactive form of carbon then can then react with the surface and then you get the growth of diamond on the surface. Okay, so that's the fast introduction. Um, chemical vapor deposition, CVD. So, a synthetic strategy for the synthesis of diamond. So the synthetic strategy is really simple. You have tools. Tools can be moved around. If the tool can be moved with six degrees of freedom, it's, it's nice to talk about six degrees of freedom because that, that means you don't have to worry about the details. You might be able to get away with fewer in various circumstances, but let's just talk about six in the general case. You have a tool that comes up. The tool is highly reactive. It reacts with the surface. You take the tool, it approaches the surface, it reacts with the surface, you pull the tool away, the surface has been modified, you pick up another tool, you approach the surface, it reacts with the surface, you pull the tool away, the surface has been further modified. By using a sequence of successive modifications of the surface, you can then build up the structure you want, sort of one step at a time, using molecular tools. And if you're going to have highly reactive tools, they better be in an inert environment or they'll react with the environment. Vacuum is a really nice inert environment, so we'll just sort of assume that we're doing things in vacuum. All right, so finally, how do you have positional, what, what would be a molecular positional device if you're going to talk about molecular tools? What about a molecular positional device? Here's a proposal for a molecular positional device. It's a robotic arm. There are other proposals floating around as well, but the idea is that something like this would be on the order of 100 nanometers tall and would allow you to manipulate structures and build them using positional synthesis and positional control. Okay. We've got about half an hour to go. Shall I go over? The, I've got two equations on thermal noise. Anyone interested in thermal noise? Thermal noise is a problem. It has to be dealt with. There are equations that describe it. I can describe the equations or I can just skip them. Skip them. Okay. Click, click. Okay, so now we start to get into the stuff we've been doing more recently. There is an annotated bibliography on diamond mechanosynthesis, which has over 50 entries in it, and it discusses a variety of different reactions that are involved in the mechanosynthesis of diamond. Um, and in particular, how many have seen this before? Okay, a couple. Oh, that's it. Gee, I've missed a bunch. Okay, well, this is a hydrogen abstraction tool. And the idea here is that we're going to have... Is that working? It takes a while. It is. It is working. Okay, good. So we have here an illustration of a hydrogen abstraction tool. This is the ethyl radical, which has a higher affinity for hydrogen than almost anything else. You bring this ethyl radical up to a surface. So here we have an illustration of a diamond 111 surface hydrogenated. Here comes the hydrogen abstraction tool and it just slept off a hydrogen and the hydrogen abstraction tool then pulls away from the surface. Isn't that amazing? We selectively remove a single hydrogen atom 
at room temperature from a diamond 111 surface, and that illustrates, and we're doing it again here, and that illustrates the, the sort of the basic concept of mechanosynthesis, and then we do it again. And this is using actually something called Brenner's potential. Brenner's potential is actually a force field. It's a molecular mechanics force field, which can handle the making and breaking of carbon-carbon and the carbon-hydrogen bonds, uh, and therefore is useful for this kind of simulation. How slow down is that? Um, lots. <laughs> it depends. I mean, basically, you could you could bring up the, the tool as slowly as you wanted to. The, the question would be the vibration, yeah, like the thermal nice vibration. vibration. Yeah. So we're looking at, I forget how many picoseconds of time here, but it's a fairly short period of time. Um, so that's... And the hydrogen extraction tool has actually been fairly well studied. So this is... Uh, all right, the claim is that in all talks you should have one slide which is either incomprehensible or just has too much stuff on it for anyone to follow. So this is the slide. And the idea is you're supposed to look at it and say, wow, there are a bunch of references on hydrogen abstraction tools. And there are. So a bunch of people have looked at it. They've looked at it using various theoretical tools. And the conclusion is always the same. Gosh, gee, it looks like the hydrogen abstraction tool will pluck off hydrogen from a hydrogenated diamond surface. Gee, that's a good thing. This is, this and is good. They are, the, uh, they are quantum chemistry simulations. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Not molecular mechanics. Yeah. Right. This is, this, we have high quality, ab initio, you know, mm -hmm. stuff, it, it goes well beyond uh, density functional. We're talking about using uh, a couple clusters with, uh, you know, all kinds of good stuff. It, basically, lots of initials, lots of, of fancy terminology, and what it boils down to <laughs> is if you burn more computer time, you can get better results. And computational chemists understand how to burn lots of computer time. <laughs> you give them more computer time, and they'll say, okay, You've given me, you know, a giant supercomputer cluster. That's fine. I can now give you better answers, and here they are. You oh, you have a bigger computer. chemist off the street, you've done a good deed. <laughs> 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 that too, yes. Yes. So, um, just you know, as a software engineer, I think of abstraction as something totally different. Why do they call it abstraction and not extraction? It's a chemical term, and I don't know. Okay. It's one of those things, you, the mysterious thing you find in the literature. There's also hydrogen donation, which is the reverse of abstraction. You know, so it's, it's, but I so okay. often call it a hydrogen plucker. Absolutely. Okay, so plucking is a nice term that, that I use. That's not considered good chemistry. Do you think ab doesn't mean you take away? Yeah. You know, abduct someone? Yeah, we're abducting hydrogens. Yeah, okay. Why don't you call it rendition? <laughs> right. I'm going to avoid getting into the bush jokes. That would just take up the rest of the time. Uh, okay, so now we're up to the point where we can selectively pluck hydrogens off of surfaces. This means we can have surfaces that are site that are reactive in a site-specific fashion. Uh, the, the next thing I'm looking at here is a dimer placement tool. This is a tool that will allow you to position two carbon atoms on a surface. And we show here a simulation where the dimer placement tool comes up to, we're showing two phases there, one where the, the dimer placement tool is touching the surface and one where it's withdrawn. They're actually, we don't have the, the nice <coughs> video of, of it, but it actually was analyzed using uh, uh, density functional theory and ab initio analysis and molecular dynamics using ab initio quantum chemistry, which means that we're pretty confident it works. It, it, it used quite a bit of computer time. So that's, that's, that, that's good stuff. And basically, it shows a germanium-based tool coming up to a 110 surface. And in this particular case, we decided we liked 110 surfaces because they're groovy surfaces, so to speak. <coughs> uh, and Basically, this is, this is at 300 Kelvin, and it, it looks like it works. So we did this. This was work done back at Zyvex, and we used a computer cluster and got a couple of us together and, and worked on it and published some papers that said, yeah, it looks like it works. So that, that looks pretty good. And that, uh, that work was about 100,000 uh, CPU hours. Yeah. And uh, in that study, we looked at uh, what happens if you bring the tool tip down at, at various angles, various tilts, uh, various lateral errors relative to the two dehydrated, hydrogenated spots that you're aiming at. And we ascertained exactly what are the limits of error in each of those directions. So we know exactly what our, 
our, our viable operating envelope is for that tool on that surface. And that's the sort of study you'd have to do with all the tools for all the surfaces you're going to do. You have to do that sort of study. So there's a lot of work that needs yeah. to get done. So yeah. it, it, it's not as though that there's any shortage of work to do. Yes? So since you did that, how many, uh, say, atom radii of error do you have there at this terminal? Uh, on that one, you don't have. You probably got to, let's see, I'm trying to remember the results of the pit. It's like um, 20 to 30 degrees of tilt. And you can't be off by more. Generally, uh, 0.2 to 0.5 angstrom is general placement accuracy, just as a rule of thumb. It, it varies a little bit from that, but that's the general range. So and if you have half an ang angstrom, you're, you can probably yeah. do entry level uh, reliable mechanosynthesis with it. It also depends on which direction you're going right, in on right. the surface, so yeah. there, there are specific right. issues there. Okay, so one of the things that, that first happens <coughs> is when we talk about the general goal of mechanosynthesis, we want to make almost anything. Making almost anything is complicated because you have a hundred elements in the period over a hundred elements in the periodic table. If you want to be able to build structures that use all of the elements in the periodic table, which obviously we're going to do one of these days, then you're going to need over a hundred tools. If you're looking at the various structures you can build with over a hundred elements, there are a lot of them. And if you put a few atoms down, suddenly there's a combinatorial explosion, so you need a lot of analysis to figure out what's going on. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that if you're talking about building things using the full periodic table, you get a lot of flexibility in your synthesis. You can have complex tools that deal with all kinds of complex, nice structures, and you can do all kinds of fun things. Make chemists real happy. You can use sophisticated chemistry. Shut your... Um, and you can build, um, you know, almost any structure consistent with physical law because you've got the full periodic table to play with. Okay, so problem is we don't want to do that. We don't want high complexity. Yes? So I'm curious you said you can build almost any structure compatible with physical law. So yeah, it's a weasel word. Which, which, <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you which structure can we not structures make? structures that, that are compatible with physical law that you couldn't build? All right, let me put it this way. It's real hard to come up with a structure and say, this is a structure you can't build. Right? It's, it, it's difficult. It would require a lot of analysis and a lot of thought. No one has even approached that. Okay, so, so no one, no one has published a structure saying, you know, I think you can't make this. <laughs> <laughs> no one's done that yet. <laughs> Someday someone's going to have to do it, but, but so far they haven't. Gallery of unbuildable parts. Yeah. <laughs> there has not been a lot of analysis on that particular problem. Okay, so we've got, all right, now we get up to the, 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 the new exciting good stuff that we're doing on the cutting edge of, of the frontier of scientific research. So Rob and I have a paper called The Minimal Tool Set for Positional Diamond Mechanosynthesis. It's going to be appearing pretty soon. We're not exactly sure which month, but it, it's going to be coming up probably probably early. Oh, yes. A couple and, of months. Yeah, and we, we find, how many people don't like patents? Yeah, okay. Um, we, uh, uh, this is a preliminary patent application. Uh, it's, it's, it's preliminary, so, you know. And, and Do you think eventually the application will get rejected because they won't read all this? Or? <laughs> no, 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 no. The rule of thumb in patent applications is if you swamp the guy, then he gives it to you. Usually what happens is they say, no, 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 I don't accept it. And if you have enough raw verbiage, you can bury them. And you just file it a couple, you know, you just send it back with, with big responses explaining why it is he's wrong and you're yeah. right. Marcus, they've only they got six it. hours for each patent, so you divide that by the pages. That's about one second per page. That's about it. <laughs> there are various interesting things going on in the patent system. One of them is the patent, the, the, the patent clerks are just over, totally overworked. So we're, we're making our contribution to taking advantage of this system. Uh, <laughs> so at any rate, the, the, the paper is going to be appearing. And the basic idea is we're going to trim the number of elements involved sharply. First off, if we're going to build diamond, we're going to need hydrogen and carbon. So the moment we say diamond, we're pretty much stuck with hydrogen and carbon. That's two elements. And then when we started looking at it, <laughs> we said, you know, we need a couple, you know, we need something because the reactions that we're looking at, we couldn't quite figure out, I and mean, maybe it's possible, we couldn't quite figure out how to get nice, clean reactions for the synthesis of stuff without tossing in something. 
And initially we thought we'd have to toss in a few elements, and we kicked it around, and then we, we got to germanium, and then Rob said, hey, maybe we can get away with just germanium, and so we kicked it around, and gee, it looks like we can get away with just germanium. So the proposal is hydrogen, carbon, germanium. This puts a sharp limit on the combinatorial explosion. It puts a sharp limit on how many elements you have to think about, so life is a lot easier. Hydrogen and carbon let you build a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, there's diamond, there's lons delight, there's graphite, there's bucky tubes, there's fullerenes, there's carbine or polyine rods, there are various organic compounds. There's a bunch of stuff you can make with just hydrogen and carbon. And the germanium we tossed in to provide just enough synthetic flexibility so we could actually make everything work out. Is the germanium ever incorporated into the structure, or is it only yes. to facilitate Yes, because among other things, you have to incorporate the germanium into the structures that are involved with germanium at the tooltip, because the germanium is what you're using in the tool. And to what degree does that restrict what you can, I mean, you can't do silicon circuitry, for example. Or can't well, we don't have silicon circuitry because we don't have silicon. But, I mean, we do germanium circuitry. Computer circuitry? Well, yeah. if you can make it out of hydrogen, carbon, and germanium, yes. Okay. But it would be very different. It would, it would, well, it would not, it would be hydrogen, carbon, and germanium, which okay. is different from silicon. And we don't get, you know, boron and phosphorus as dopant atoms, not with this tool set. And you're not trying to simulate the electronic properties. And we're not, the device right. we have. Okay. So no, we're, we, we're explicitly walking away from electronics in this particular this is just structural. This is structure. We can build stuff that's structurally interesting. Maybe there's some fun electronic stuff, but by the time we get there and start building it, okay, we build this set, and then we throw in couple of extra tools to deal with other atoms so we can build other structures. But right now the, the focus is on let's have a proposal that's simple enough that we can analyze it, but flexible enough that it clearly opens up some huge range of possibilities. So that's that's what we're doing. And that's that's the focus of this. And to do this, we went ahead and did some analysis. We got ourselves a nice computational chemistry program called Gaussian. It's a standard computational chemistry program. One of the things going on is when you publish a paper, part of the credibility of your paper is, we used Gaussian. <laughs> <laughs> and computational chemists know what Gaussian is. They say, OK, if these guys did Gaussian and they, they did it right, they fed in the right inputs, and we describe what inputs we used in the paper. Then people will look at, oh, you used Gaussian, and you used, you know, this, that, and the other parameters. Okay, uh, I don't know who these guys are, but I know what Gaussian is, and I know the parameters they use, and that should be good. So part of the credibility is simply the computational chemistry package. So we went ahead and analyzed it, and it's... 1,630 tooltip workpiece structures. Oh my God. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> two or three years. Uh, 65 reaction sequences, 328 reaction steps, 354 unique pathological side reactions. One of the problems is you bring a tool up to a surface, there's what you want to have happen, and then there's all the stuff you don't want to have happen. <laughs> and you have to analyze all the stuff that you don't want to have happen to make sure it won't happen. <laughs> so we had to spend a lot of time analyzing stuff that we didn't want to have happen to make sure it wouldn't happen. Then we had to throw stuff out and start over again on various occasions. Uh, and, and so how did you arrive at the pathological side reactions? You basically had uh, a situation where something came together and it reacted and you looked at it and saw, oh, it reacted in the wrong way. Okay, so we didn't do molecular dynamics. What we did was do specific analysis of the energies of reaction. And we'd eyeball it and say, you know, it's conceivably possible that maybe, you know, this hydrogen could go off and bond with that carbon, or this carbon could slip in the following ugly conformation, or... Uh, so, so you we postulated were scenarios and then you tested them. Yeah. Okay. Right. You spent a lot of time trying to postulate all the scenarios yeah. you could okay. possibly think of. Yeah. And one of the reactions I think it had, I think our largest one had ten different pathologies associated with a particular reaction. Usually it's more like three or four. Something like that. So did you throw out that one reaction, or is it still in? Well, yourself? the one that if, if 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 the ones if the pathological states are preferred energetically to the one we want, that it's thrown out. We got right. it. We got it. Won't work. It'll go to the or if two are very close in energy, that means the reaction isn't reliable enough. It might work half the time, but the other half it won't. We throw that out. It's got to be clearly um, energetically preferred by a, a a level of energy margin that we set at the beginning of the paper that we believe gives us enough reliability that we can. 
we can use that. So. And all those 65 reaction sequences fit within that? They all, they all pass all the tests, yeah, exactly. And what's nice is that the, the set of reactions is complete. So you start out, uh, oh, and this is the computational methods. This probably isn't interesting to most no. of you. Okay, and here are the tools. So there are nine tools. So starting from the upper left, we have the hydrogen abstraction tool. That's the final radical. This is the tool that's been studied so extensively in the literature, and we're pretty comfortable with it. Uh, the next one is a hydrogen donation tool. You'll notice that it has a yellow atom. That yellow atom is a germanium, and the germanium hydrogen bond is a fairly weak bond, so this tool can be used to donate a hydrogen to a growing carbon structure. So if you've got, for example, a carbon radical, a dangling bond on a growing structure, you can bring up the hydrogen donation tool, donate a hydrogen, pull a tool back, and the hydrogen will stick on the surface. Uh, we have the GM tool, which is the germomethylene tool, which has got germanium and it's got a methylene on top. The methylene is reactive. Again, the germanium carbon bond is supposed to be weak, so if you bring this tool up to a surface where there's a dangling bond, the carbon, the, the reactive carbon on the tip of the tool will react with the surface. You can draw back the tool. The germanium carbon bond is weak, so the germanium carbon bond should break, so you pull the tool back. So this tool is useful for taking a carbon atom and plopping it onto a surface at a specific location. Then we have a germaline tool, that's sort of the flip side, that's got a carbon uh, at the bridgehead position and a germanium atom, so now you can use this tool to bring up a germanium to a structure. You have to go through more antics in order to pull back and make sure that the germanium actually sticks with the surface and not with the tool, but you can make that happen. We've got a methylene tool, this actually, you can make it work if you're patient with it. It's got uh, a carbon-carbon bond, so when you bring it up to a surface, obviously you've got a problem in the sense that if you're bonding a carbon to a surface and you've also bonded the carbon atom to the tip of the tool with a car to a carbon atom, then basically you've got a tug-of-war between, you know, you've got one carbon atom and a carbon on the surface and a carbon on the tool, you've got a tug-of-war. You have to play games in order to make it come off in the right way. But you can play games of various sorts. It's more complicated to use, but you can do that. And we've got some example reaction sequences where that's true. The hydrogen transaction tool is actually uh, simply the germanium radical brought up and bonded to the hydrogen abstraction tool with the hydrogen on the tip. It turns out that if you do this, that the hydrogen on the tip is now very weakly bonded to the carbon atom. So the hydrogen on the tip is now going to fall off at any excuse. So this is a great way of donating a hydrogen to a structure. But if you pull back on the germanium, the germanium will uh, then uh, leave that uh, structure and leave the hydrogen behind, so you'll then have a very stable structure. So you can use that, that particular tool both to uh, weaken the bond and also to strengthen the bond. <coughs> then we have an, a simple adamantane radical, which is the carbon radical that you can bring up and use as a carbon radical. We have the dimer placement tool, which we discussed earlier, that's got two germanium atoms, and it uses a, a dimer to place that on a surface. And finally, the germanium radical. And that's it. Nine tools, period. End of discussion. So are these tools used once to throw them away, or can you refill them? Or refill? Yes. We have complete recharge sequences for all the tools. And you can build these tools using these tools? Yes. yes. That's the... Yes. Yes. Nice yes. 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 And I suppose it goes without saying these are all built on an adamantane base, which which gives you the assumption you can attach it to a larger mm. structure, which is a regular diamond lattice, and that's the idea. Yeah, I have a question about that. How much do Van der Waals forces or other effects there come into play based on the fact that it is attached to some other larger structure? The answer is it's there, but it's not something that prevents it from working. So. But that wasn't part of your explosive simulation? Uh, the explosive simulation was using small structures to model the chemical reaction to the tip. Are these all easily synthesizable from the get-go? Oh, can you synthesize these, these without tools, tools, tools without the tools? Without the tools. <laughs> In other words, can you build these to begin with? And the answer, okay, we're currently discussing with various folks uh, what it we is. Have, we have proposals in the paper for how to build three of these tools using only current technology. And we have an experimentalist who has told us that he thinks that it's, it looks reasonable and he wants to try doing it. 
That's as far as we've gotten with that. Are those three tools enough to make all nine? Probably. Probably. Uh, the purpose of this was to establish, you know, to get a complete set of reactions, because this, this hasn't been done before. Basically, enumerating a set of tools and enumerating a full set of reactions involved in making those tools from raw material and also showing that you can build a, a you know, wide range of interesting other structures just haven't been done. Yes. Um, all, all of these things predicate that, the, that you have a diamond substrate surface that is yep. perfect to start off with. With current diamond deposition technologies, how big in nanometers? How big a patch? is a patch that's perfect. How big is the patch? I don't know the patch size. I know you can build them fairly big. Uh, yeah, you know, tens of nanometers. Couldn't you just take a natural yeah. diamond and cleave it and patch no, it? It's not perfect well, enough. It's not perfect. Yeah. Well, you get small bits that are perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how big a how big a spot? You don't need a big spot to start using the tools. Well, you really only need, you need tools. You need an adamantine cage. Yeah. Because basically, what we can do is we can. It's very easy to build these structures if you if you have a starting adamantine cage. You can then start adding things on, and building more cages on the first cage. So you really only need a a tip which has you know a cage at the bottom, and you can use that to build off. You don't need to have start with a flat surface. Okay. You could also use a flat surface. But. Okay. Well, it's like an easy way to explain how do you manipulate these tools. The answer is yeah. So, so obviously if you have a set of tools and the question is how do you manipulate them, obviously you could start manipulating using some kind of descendant of existing scanning probe microscopes. And you could start to say, okay, I can position something using a, a macro scale device. You could also start saying these could be used at the tip of a molecular scale device, so that robotic arm I was showing or some other molecular position device could be used to position them. And there are ways you can control that remotely. Obviously, we don't have that. How do I put it? If you're talking about molecular positional devices, well, first we've got to get the molecular positional devices. And then we have to discuss how it is you control those remotely. So that's, that's you know, another step we're along the path. Proposal. We're, yeah, that's, that's, we're currently working on a proposal for, you know, what is, the, what is the grand scheme for putting all of this stuff together. I should mention, by the way, that the reason we went ahead and did this work is that when we were at Zyvex, we went through a complete design for an assembler, discussed it with everybody, discussed what things they were concerned about, and the general concern there, as well as other places where I've talked about it, was exactly what are the chemical reactions. So if you have a, a complete analysis of the specific chemical reactions, this <coughs> puts to rest a whole set of concerns and issues which we had previously determined to be the most uh, the things that were most pressing on people's minds, the things that people were most concerned about. So, how developed is that? <coughs> um, so your germane tool acts as a germanium, a way for you to place a germanium. Yep. And your methylene tool gives you a way to extract a germanium. <coughs> no. The, the methylene tool is a way to put a methylene down. <coughs> the germal methylene tool does it better. And it turns out we need the methylene tool to build the germal methylene tool. So, but you can you can also deposit methylene using the using the methylene tool. If you want. So if I if I place a germanium incorrectly, which tool do I use to get it off? You don't. Yeah. You don't want to. The complete analysis. The analysis at this point says here is a set of reaction sequences for building something. There's no we erasure. We haven't gone into the. Here's how you want to do it. Don't yeah, like the program. You don't have an eraser. Yet. The reason I ask that is because you, some of these tools are opposites. You have an, a tool that removes a hydrogen and a tool that places a hydrogen. Yes. Right. So there are certain well, mistakes I can recover from. Yes. Well, no, but, 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 but the other can. problem is if you're dealing with mistakes, then you have a whole set of issues of, okay, if I'm dealing with a mistake, then I have to monitor the surface and look at it and get feedback and so forth and so on. This is obviously going to be critical in the early stages. But in the longer term, uh, it looks as though we can have systems that work reliably or, or have a high, high probability of working correctly the first time. Right. Yeah. Uh, removing the hydrogen is not correcting a mistake. You remove a hydrogen because you want to create a radical site. Okay. Agreed. Now that happens to be, if you put a hydrogen in the wrong place, it happens that you could remove it with the abstraction tool. So you could correct that type of mistake. But in general, you're not going to be correcting mistakes. And none of the other tools are, are, are intended to abstract anything else. Hydrogen is the only thing we abstract. Everything else is a deposition action. But I don't, you said that all of these tools have kind of the reload capability. Yes. yes. Um, how do you reload the, what's the, what? Well, there's reaction, we have reaction sequences in here 
for building or reloading all nine tools. So I mean it's in the it's in the document and I mean it's like a bunch of steps. So you have to you know, connect this and connect that and pull that off and that sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> what threshold of reliability did you require when you're deciding if a pathologic side reaction was enough to knock out a reaction? Like we, we used uh, we used uh, um, 0.4 EV was our minimum criteria, and we figured that would give us probably um, uh, at room temperature something like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7th error rate. At liquid nitrogen temperatures, it'd go way up. It'd be like 10 to the minus 20 something. So at liquid nitrogen, it's, we we actually could have uh, made a slightly <coughs> different system if we wanted to just do everything at liquid nitrogen, and that it wouldn't work at room temperature. We could have we do you know we would have a, more of a design space, but we wanted to have something that had a chance of also working at, at room temperature. So. Okay, and, and here's an example. Six errors. Ten of them, uh, yeah, ten of my six. Ten. Of them, yeah, every every time you you do, you do t uh, ten million operations, by chance one of them will will be a mistake, just because of thermal vibrations. Right. So you you know, and most of these things, you, the uh, the tools are like uh, 30, 40 atoms each. So you can build pretty large structures. You know, you can build uh, maybe uh, hundred, a thousand of those of those gear things before one of them would have an atom misplaced. And presumably, if you have that many built, you, can, you know, you test them and you throw out the one defect out of a thousand, so it's, it's, good, it's good enough for an, for, an, for an entry system. So and here's an illustration of how you recharge the hydrogen abstraction tool. It just goes through a sequence of reactions, and this is fairly typical of the kind of stuff you do. So I think we've run out of time at this point. Okay, so,